Yes, I'm ready. Okay. Ready? Go on. Yes. Yeah. So I'll free and we are live. Very pleasant evening to all of you. Welcome to our brand new episode of our academic program on obesity management, which is hosted together by Doc Nexus and Center for Metabolic Surgery, headed by Dr. Raman Goyal. CMS is amongst India's top bariatric surgery center. It comprises a team of surgeons, physicians, dietitians, and psychologists to assist on weight loss surgeries. We have a very, very special guest with us today to talk about obesity and pregnancy. The name is not unknown to anyone in the medical fraternity, Dr. Kiran Koheno. It's a pleasure to have you here, ma'am. Dr. Kiran Koheno is head of department of OBGYN at Leelavati Hospital and Research Center, Mumbai, since 1996. She's also an honorary consultant of OBGYN in Hinduja Healthcare Surgical and Fa Holy Family Hospital. She's also a member of managing committee of IHGS 2021. Prior to this, she was assistant professor at the Tamil Nadu Medical College and BYL Nair Hospital. She is a faculty of CMAS, which is the Center of Excellence in Minimal Access Surgery Training. So she has had visiting ob observership in robotic surgery from Mayo Clinic, USA, in 2019. She has been practicing minimal invasive surgery since 1994 and has trained more than 500 gynecologists in gyne and endoscopy. Currently, she's a DNB teacher and has over 40 years of teaching experience. She has been felicitated by the Guinness Book of World Records for being a part of world's largest health talk on breast cancer awareness. It's an honor to have you here, ma'am. I would now request you to please commence your talk. Thank you so much. I share my screen. Good evening, everyone. It's indeed a pleasure to be part of Dr. Plexus. And as I said, when Dr. Raman Goel calls, I always come. And uh, today I'll be speaking on a very, very pertinent topic, obesity and pregnancy. We know that in the 21st century has seen an epidemic of obesity and other lifestyle diseases that are interlinked and have similar metabolic consequences. During the same time span, we have witnessed a parallel remarkable progress in infertility management as well. And as a result, we are seeing more and more obese women getting pregnant. We'll go to the next. So, one minute. Yeah. The hospitals I work, Leelavati and Kar Hinduja. And First of all, I just define obesity. It's defined as having a BMI of 30 or greater, a body weight of more than 20% the normal weight for the optimal height of the individual. And the BMI or the body mass index is a useful measure of obesity and is a simple index for weight for height used to classify underweight, overweight, and obese adults. The BMI is calculated by dividing a person's weight in kilograms by the square of their height in meters. That the kilograms or meter square. The lowest risk is a BMI of 30 to 34.9. Medium risk is a BMI of 35 to 39.9. And the highest risk is a BMI of 40 or greater. Now in India, we come across both nutritional extremes. Undernutrition is more prevalent in rural areas whereas obesity is three times higher in urban areas. It is believed that in severely undernourished women, as well as in those with extreme degrees of obesity, anovulation and amenorrhea are highly prevalent. It is perhaps nature's way of suspending reproduction in nutritional extremes, as nature finds the state metabolically unsuitable for procreation. However, because of the advances of in infertility, such women are also getting pregnant, giving us new challenges. And bariatric surgery has added issues in the management of such pregnant and obese women. Now, in the USA, two-thirds of women of childbearing age group are obese or overweight. The prevalence in UK has also increased from 9 to 10% in the early 1990s to 16 to 19% in the 2000s. And in the Indian subcontinent, the prevalence of overweight or overweight married women, obese or overweight married women, in the age group of 15 to 49 years, rose from 11 to 15% in the 2005-06 as per National Health Survey 
three and further to a 20.6 percent as per national uh, family health survey number four and so we know that the bsi i just turn off my phone sorry as I just said, BMI less than 18, it is the underweight, then of course the average, overweight and the obese range. Now, the well, how much weight does a person put on during pregnancy? In the first trimester, the total weight gain in a healthy pre-pregnancy state is, I would say, I would say the total in a, pre, in a healthy BMI woman, a woman would gain about 11 to 16 kilos. In an overweight BMI pre-pregnancy, then it should be ranging between 7 to 15. And in a patient who's obese during pregnancy, the range should be only 5 to 10 kilos. That is recommended weight gain for an obese patient during pregnancy. Now, let's say, see the weight gain during pregnancy. 25 to 40 percent of women gain more weight than they should during pregnancy. And this is more so in urban India. Because in urban India, pregnant women are very pampered. They are given extra food, so much of ghee, etc. Thinking that they would, and they many very often eat for two. So weight gain is quite a lot during pregnancy. And this is what we have to, uh, you know, work against. Now, the adipose tissue serves the following functions. It's an energy storehouse, a cushion from trauma, regulation of body heat, and hormone production. But when there is an imbalance, then obesity occurs. Now let's see the effect of obesity on pregnancy. In the antepartum period, that is during period, the period before the patient delivers, there is a greater chance of spontaneous abortions and recurrent miscarriage, a greater chance of congenital anomalies, stillbirths, preeclampsia, gestational diabetes, and occult type two diabetes. So this is a known factor. There are Cardiac dysfunctions, there's sleep apnea, proteinuria, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is seen in obese patients. And this is very important during pregnancy because during pregnancy, there is a load on the liver already. And these patients are more prone to get uh, liver disorders during pregnancy, which could be fatal. Carpal tunnel syndrome, because of the obesity, pregnancy associated, uh, I think that's pregnancy associated with high blood pressure, I'm sorry for that. And post-term pregnancy and also multi-fetal pregnancies are more common in obese women. Now, during labor or intrapartum, these women are more likely to have induction of labor, a cesarean delivery, a failed trial of labor if they were previous cesarean section. They are more prone to get infection of the uterus, endometritis, and if they have C-sections, womb dehiscence, and venous thrombosis because they are, they are less mobile than would be a non obese women. Now, in the postpartum and long-term sequel, in obese women with pregnancy, they have postpartum weight retention. There's early termination or not at all breastfeeding. Postpartum anemia, depression, infection, venous thromboembolism, we see a lot. Postpartum hemorrhage and prolonged hospitalizations. Now, in the fetus of women who have morbid obesity, there are greater chances of congenital anomalies, fetal death, intrauterine fetal death, prematurity, macrosomia or large babies, low five-minute APGAR scores, neonatal seizures, hypoglycemia, impaired growth, meconium aspiration, greater chance of NICU admission, and studies have shown that there is more than a two-fold risk from fetal distress as evidenced by low APGAR scores. Now, this uh, study uh, from JAMA says very clearly that the absolute risks for 10,000 pregnancies for body mass uh, categories of 20, 25, and 30, there is a definite increase in fetal death, stillbirth, perinatal death, neonatal death, and infant deaths. Also, there is in this study shows an increase in the congenital anomalies in obese versus non-obese gravida, where there is an increase in neural tube defects, spina bifida, cardiovascular anomalies, septal anomalies, cleft palate, cleft lip and palate, anorectal atresia, hydrocephaly, and limb reduction anomalies. And this is well documented. 
Now, in the child, when they grow up, they may have a metabolic syndrome, they may have childhood obesity, asthma, altered behavior, and studies have shown a four-fold increased lifetime risk of overweight, overweight and obesity, and a lifelong elevated risk for diabetes, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, cancer, and early death. These are children of maternally obese women. Now, there is, a, as I said earlier, there's a greater risk of induction of labor because they don't go into labor frequently because the head is high and not well applied to the cervix. So there's an increased risk of post-term pregnancy and subsequently there's an increased risk of labor induction. And it is estimated to be at least 1.7 to 2.4 fold. There's an increased risk of operative delivery. And this is the really important thing because with most of these women, instrumental delivery like forceps and vacuum increased by 18% if women with a BMI of 35.5 to 40, increased 34% in a BMI more than 40. The cesarean delivery is more common, 47.4% compared to control patients of 20.7%. As for this study, uh, we said all, but this was in 2004. And more recent studies show that in obesity, especially when the BMI is more than 40, 100, 90 to 100% of them do develop, do have to have an elective cesarean section. The rate of uh, normal delivery following cesarean section are also very much reduced. Now, the operative risks uh, during cesarean section for an obese woman are indefinitely increased operative time found in the morbidly obese. The increase in operation theater time, there's a linear increase in skin addition, uh, skin incision, uterus time to the uh, delivery of the baby that increases, and therefore there's a decline in umbilical artery pH. So it takes a longer time to take out the babies in these uh, pa patients. There's inaccurate or difficulty in pressure monitoring. The anesthetist is always alarmed when we have a very obese patient because they are finding it difficult in pressure monitoring. There's reduced functional residual capacity. There's sleep apnea syndrome, increase in reflux, iota cable compression, and poor pulmonary perfusion. There are difficulties with regional anesthesia. When you give a spinal anesthesia, the veins are difficult, unable to find um, the lumbar spine because of curvature. There's impalpable iliac crests. So all their various parameters by which they find the spine and to put in the spinal needle are all uh, altered because of extreme obesity and impalpable vertebral spines. All that leads to difficulty with spinal anesthesia. And with general anesthesia, there's rapid desaturation on induction. There's risk of regurgitation, potential difficult intubation, potential difficult ventilation, and a difficult tracheostomy. Now, let's see the management during uh, pregnancy. There are ex extra needs for these women when they come in for both for their antenatal period and also for their delivery. We need larger birthing beds. The average birthing bed for us in India are very narrow. So we need these large size birthing beds, large chairs, wheelchairs, pressure, blood pressure cuffs will never work for these uh, obese women. So we have to have special blood pressure cuffs, motorized lifts, operating table and long instruments uh, for these patients. Now let's see, prevention is always better than care. So then, uh, then the cure. So let us see how do we develop this preconceptional care and advice. We must have a preconceptional screening. Uh, diabetes mellitus, if they have diabetes mellitus, optimize blood sugar, look for thyroid diseases and treat them. The TSH should be less than equal to or less than 2.5 when the woman embarks on pregnancy. Otherwise, she will be, because of the stress of pregnancy, she will get hypothyroidism later on as well. Vaccinations, of course, we give rubella varicella and always put the patient on prenatal folic acid to prevent neural tube defects, which are anyway increased in obese women. Now, let us see how we will see this patient through the first trimester or the first three months of pregnancy. We have to do baseline assessments, like, of course, maternal weight and the body BMI is uh, calculated, blood pressure using an appropriately sized cuff, 
early ultrasound, not only to know the gestational age, because very often we cannot palpate and find out what is the gestational age. So an early ultrasound is a dating ultrasound, not only for gestational age, but also to rule out any multifetal uh, twins or triplets, etc., which are more common in obese women. Medication review, and if the patient is diabetic and on oral hyperglycemic drugs, we should discontinue it very often in favor of insulin therapy. Diabetes screening is a must in first trimester. And of course, quantitative urine protein, kidney function tests, platelet count, liver function tests, because many of them have NASH, and baseline evaluation for preeclampsia or pregnancy-induced hypertension. Obesity, we know, is a known risk for, risk for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And if the patient has had bariatric surgery, we have to evaluate for and treat nutritional deficiencies. Now, counseling. Uh, in the first trimester, self we counsel the, for the pregnancy risks associated with obesity. We give them a proper diet in consultation with the dietitian. We explain how much the gestational weight gain should be. And of course, good counseling on exercise, where definitely an ex uh, a prenatal or uh, Lama's um, consultant could be consulted to give appropriate exercise. We have to encourage weight loss by 5 to 10, 7% in the first trimester and promote lifestyle modifications like a hypocaloric diet, exercise program, and medication. Failure to lose 10% of weight despite lifestyle and diet control will be ominous for such patients later on. Then in the first trimester, most importantly, even though we do fetal aneuploidy screening for all women today, it's especially important in the obese mother. It should be the same as for general. The obese women are not at increased risk for fetal aneuploidy. They are more in, at risk for neural tube defects. Obesity can affect the screening test performance. And if we do what we call an NIPT or a non-invasive prenatal testing, then the cell-free fetal DNA screening is more likely to, to result in test failure. So therefore, serum-based screening tests are adjusted for maternal weight and so that the obesity does not affect the test performance. An accurate nuclear translucency measurement that we do at 11 to 13 weeks will be more difficult to obtain because of the abdominal fat. So very often we have to use a transvaginal probe even at this late stage of pregnancy, which normally we would do transabdominal, but we'd have to use a transvaginal probe to get a more accurate uh, NT measurement. And diagnostic procedures like amniocentesis, this is Corion Willis sampling, etc., more challenging technically. And we have to use a low frequency tract and vaginal probe in the umbilicus and all sorts of permutations and commutations to get a proper testing for uh, screening in the first trimester. And of course, the first trimester is also a period of time where we would like to do reference. If there's an underlying cardiopulmonary disease is suspected, then cardiology or pulmonology uh, reference should be considered. Consider uh, sending uh, to a diabetologist, a sleep specialist if there are symptoms, and of course, to the dietitian. Most important reference. Now we come to the second trimester, that is from 20 weeks up to 28 weeks. This is the time where we would like to start low dose aspirin uh, because th these are the women who are very prone to get deep vein thrombosis and we have to protect them against that low dose aspirin till 32 weeks of pregnancy is definitely uh, advised. And we know that the BMI of more than 30 kilo uh, kg per m square or BMI of more than 30 is a moderate risk for preeclampsia. And so they should be on a salt restricted diet from now. And therefore, they will definitely benefit from two, a salt restricted diet as well as low dose aspirin. Other moderate risk factors are if the patient is having a baby for the first time, nulliparity, a family history of preeclampsia and mother or sister, uh, races, of course, increased maternal age and personal factors, like if there was a low birth weight or small for gestational age, previous adverse uh, pregnancy outcome, and a more than 10-year pregnancy interval. Very often, a woman would have a baby at 24, and then she would wait for 36 for her next baby. By that time, she has become obese. So there is an adverse pregnancy outcome if the interval between births is more than 10 years. Now, the fetal ultrasound 
surveys. More very important at this point of time is a 3D anomaly scan, which we do between 18 to 24 weeks. Now, due to the limitations of ultrasound with increasing degrees of obesity, a concomitant use of maternal serum alpha fetoprotein to screen for neural de tube defects and other relevant congenital defects are very important. So not only will we do the, the, this thing, we will also do the quadruple marker test. Uh, maternal obesity per se is not an indication for fetal echocardiography, but usually as a routine, we would do it at 24 weeks because very often at 20 weeks, the fetal cardiac abnormalities don't show up. They show up after 22 weeks at around 24 weeks. Unless, of course, the, uh, the ultrasound was not, and usually it is not optimal. So I would like to do a fetal echocardiography. Now, screening for gestational diabetes is ideally rec recommended between 20 or 24 to, uh, we'd like to do it at 20 weeks, 20 to 28 weeks of gestation, where we do a, a 75 grams glucose test with five, read five values so that we have a proper screening for gestational diabetes. Then assessment of fetal growth, the clinical assessment in these women are a little more difficult and challenging because of the maternal obesity. So ultrasound assessment is better. And although the frequency of fetal demise appears to be increased in pregnancies of obese women, the value of antenatal fetal surveillance with non-stress test biophysical profile scoring in this has not been studied in many, uh, in many uh, studies. But I think after the age of 36 weeks, we'll come to it in the last trimester, but after 36 weeks of gestation, um, NSTs and biophysical profile scoring should be done every third day because we know that in obese women, sudden infant death happens after the age of 38 weeks. Now we'll come to labor and delivery. So monitoring of the patient in the last trimester, of course, very important. After 36 weeks of gestation, we do NST, biophysical profile more frequently. And we would like to induce these patients after 38 or 39 completed weeks. Don't let them go beyond the due date. Now in the labor and delivery, equipment and instruments would change when you have a very obese patient. We have to ensure that the labor and delivery unit has adequate large gowns. You know, very often what happens, these patients are very, very embarrassed when they come to the labor room and they find that nothing fits them. So we must have, once we have an obese patient in our labor room, we should provide for adequate gowns, uh, beds, operating room table to care for these women and not embarrass them. Fetal monitoring, of course, is completely done throughout labor in a continuous fetal monitoring. Uh, scalp electrodes, we don't use so much in India. Anesthesia consultation is a must because very often we would ask them to uh, either have an epidural or if they land up in C-section, the anesthetist should see them, uh, evaluate them prior to labor or in early labor because of their higher risks of anesthetic complications. And for patients planning a vaginal birth, early placement of epidural catheter may obviate the need for general anesthesia if an emergency C-section is required. And I do this very often. Call them when the patient is, say, two to three centimeters dilated. Put in an epidural catheter and keep it in place. If they have a normal delivery, well and good, but otherwise they are already uh, we are prepared for an emergency cesarean section. Timing and route of delivery is also important. Delivery by the estimated due date has been recommended, but usually we uh, do uh, after 38 weeks, we, uh, we would like to induce them because the complications from continuing fetal growth are much more in obese women. Than, and there are several studies which I'm not quoting, but they're very much more in obese women after 38 weeks of gestation. <laughs> Uh, in a cesarean delivery, since most of these women do have cesarean deliveries, there is very important operative and perioperative care, which is required. Of course, we've already spoken about the anesthesia consultation, and they must have a develop an anesthetic plan that addresses availability of proper equipment for blood pressure monitoring, venous access, influence of comorbid conditions like sleep apnea should be considered uh, for these patients, and an increased risk for hypoxemia, hypercapnia, and sudden death. <laughs> Now, in spinal uh, epidural or spinal anesthesia, it's definitely indicated the technical difficulties, of course, our body habitus and loss of landmarks. In the 
epidural in the obese has greater energetic failure. So early epidural catheter placement is always necessary. There may be extreme hypotension and prolonged fetal heart deceleration soon after an epidural. This is something that we should always be prepared for. And sign a spinal anesthesia and obese significantly impairs respiratory function for up to two hours after the procedure, which is what we have to be prepared for also. General anesthesia is not contraindicated, but there are certain considerations which have to be given. Uh, one is difficulties in endocranial uh, intubation. So you must have fiber optic equipment available for intubation. There should be adequate pre-oxygenation and proper patient positioning. Now, of course, thromboprophylaxis, one of the most important things that we have to do when we do C-sections in obese women, must use a pneumatic, a pneumatic compression device at the time of cesarean delivery. And for obese women, there's an additional risk factor venous thrombosis. So we must use both pharmacological and mechanical thrombo uh, prophylaxis for these women. So we always give low molecular weight extent for these uh, women. Uh, antibiotic prophylaxis, of course, very important because of so much of fat, they are going to have uh, infection. Preoperative antibiotic prophylaxis for all women and those who are undergoing cesarean section, we would like to step up to a broad uh, spectrum antibiotic uh, should be and should be given as per maternal weight. Now, in the operative procedure, when we do a C-section, the type of incision is very important because these women have a huge paniculus. Uh, some of the paniculus is so big that it covers almost the knee, as Dr. Raman well would know, that the paniculus is so large that the paniculus of the this thing comes even up to the patient's knee. So then how do we give the incision? We can't give a vertical incision because there's a higher rate of wound complication, infection, stoma, hematoma, wound evisceration, and facial dehiscence. We give it supra suppose there's a large paniculus but if we can lift the paniculus upwards favorably then we can take the paniculus have two assistants hold the paniculus upwards and then give a supra pubic incision and get away very nicely with a fan and steel incision if so if the panis can be adequately attracted kefalad then that is the best option but sometimes the paniculus is so large that we cannot bring it kefalad. Then in that case, we have to give a supra umbilical incision. And uh, so the women who are more than 170, they are less than 170 kilo, we can manage with a fan and steel, but with those very morbidly obese women who are more than 170 kilos, then a transverse supra umbilical incision uh, is suggested, which displaces the panis, uh, the caudally. And really we can get to, I have done one case, uh, Dr. Raman, uh, of a, a woman who was uh, 220 kilos and I had to, the paniculus was so large, I went super umbilically, but believe me, it was easy. So that is how we plan our incision. Then while making the incision, you have to be pay attention to the distorted landmarks in obese women. The umbilicus is often anatomically directly over the lower uterine segment. So that's why the paniculus has to be lifted up. And um, then the facial closure also, you have to be very careful in giving a very good double breasting um, smith uh uh, closure for the rectus sheath and the sutures uh, on the abdominal wall should be always interrupted to allow for enough of the serosal material then to be absorbed. One should not um, uh, close with a continuous suture so that there should not be a seroma below our suture line. And uh, that these are various uh, subcutaneous closure should be done. And you should avoid placing subcutaneous drain. So close the subcutaneous tissue very well. Um, if it's more than two centimeters, don't place a drain because those drains sometimes cause infection rather than reduce infection. But an interrupted stitch, if you do, even if there's a sedoma and you give a tight bandage, um, uh, then you won't have a subcutaneous collection. And uh, show close with staples rather than stitches because they give a firmer wound closure. Now let us come to the postpartum uh, period. This again is a very, very important period in uh, a, po a very obese pregnant woman. You have to prevent a venous thromboembolism. And for all women, we give mechanical thromboprophylaxis in the form of your um, uh, cuff for the uh, both the legs, and then uh, you give, uh, ask the patient to uh, give thromboprophylaxis in the form of low molecular weight heparin, 
uh, which is given even before the labor, six to eight hours, and continued for three days after the delivery, and uh, allow the patient not to be on immobile, severe ability. The immobility is so much, so uh, your patient has to be mobilized very fast. And as soon as the patient has, um, uh, infe you have to. Uh, protect against infection as even in emergency cesarean section and continue the prophylaxis until the woman is fully ambulated. Low molecular weight evident for the treatment of prevention and treatment of venous thrombolism in, instead of unfraction and heparin, that of course goes uh, without saying. And you start six to eight hours, 12 hours post-operative, they start pre-operatively and continue post-operatively for six to 12 hours as well. Then maintain a strict uh, prevention of SSI. Of course, the risk is in C-section is 18.4%. Maintain a strict glycemic control in diabetes mellitus. Give good preoperative antibiotics, intraoperative as well as postoperative. Uh, higher dose of preoperative IV antibiotic prophylaxis. Uh, hair remover for you know. Rather than shaving for hair removal in preoperative, it is better to use clippers because sometimes the shaving day will, will cause infection of the skin. Very, very important. And of course, a good skin prep, prep, prep before surgery. Alcoholic uh, rub, uh, hand uh, rub for uh, preoperative antisepsis is more con effective than conventional surgical scrub. And close the skin with subcutaneous sutures and also um, staples. Breastfeeding should be done immediately. Promote breastfeeding, which will uh, uh, promote further weight gain. Each time the woman breastfeeds a baby, it's like walking about uh, 1,000 steps. Now, uh, post bariatric surgery, I think Dr. Raman Goel will definitely uh, have a long talk on that. It's a recent challenge in our management. The pregnancy should be avoided for 12 to 18 months after bariatric surgery. And uh, post bariatric surgery, symptoms, complications may occur during pregnancy, persistent vomiting, GI bleeding, anemia, et cetera, et cetera. I think adolescents undergoing bariatric surgery need special counseling. Pregnancy rates after bariatric surgery are twice the rates in the general population, so they have to be given adequate uh, uh, contraceptive uh, counseling and uh, alternative tests for diabetes. Gestational diabetes should be considered with those with malabsorptive type of surgery. Intravenous glucose ch challenge tests may be necessary. Evaluation of micronutrient deficiencies, especially in the first trimester. Slow or delays, uh, delayed release preparations are to be avoided because then they won't work because they have a very small stomach. Post-bariatric surgery, pregnancies and delivery should be under the combined care or by the bariatric surgeon, physician, and expert obstetrician in a higher center. This is the most important point. And of course, is in said delivery. And Dr. Raman Goel will speak in great detail <laughs> regarding this. So in conclusion, obesity in pregnancy poses greater challenges both to the mother and the baby. Therefore, all hands should be on deck to prevent this disorder and the potential sequelae associated with this condition. And I thank you all for a very patient hearing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Kiran. That was truly a very, very insightful presentation. I think no one could have explained it better. Thank and you. I would now request Dr. Raman to please share his inputs on the thing. So I think, Dr. Coelho, that was so elaborate. And, uh, you know, I have heard so many talks on obesity and pregnancy. Uh, this is probably the best uh, of them. Thank because you, so you have not only covered the obesity part, you have also covered how to manage them in our obstetric setup. And uh, a great learning for me, we have to place an incision. Obviously, I'm not going to do a cesarean. Yeah. But to realize that, uh, you know, if someone has to take an incision for pelvic approach in a morbidly obese person, then umbilicus, uh, uh, supra umbilical area also, you can reach the pelvis very easily. So I think great inputs, and I'm sure this will be beneficial to all the family physicians and obstetricians also, because uh, uh, this, uh, for family physicians, it's a great learning to explain to their patients how to be managed after, uh, uh, during pregnancy or after uh, uh, delivery. I have two questions for you, if you don't sure. mind. Yeah. So one is, uh, though we work together in our institution where um, 
we manage bariatric patients so you have infrastructure but what about the infrastructure because we are seeing increasing number of young women coming with obesity and severe obesity so when they are coming for labor do you do you have do the hospitals have infrastructure in the labor room for managing such women now yeah now mo- most of tertiary care centers dr raman goel like where i work lilavati and all these we and when we know in advance that we are getting obese patients yes we do have a separate set of bpi um, cuffs we have a big bed which we have specially ordered Uh, both in uh, hinduja as well as in dilavati um, the birthing uh, bed for a large uh, woman then we have special set of clothes etc because that you know it's very embarrassing you have them on the gowns which is open and their whole back is open you know so they they are very sensitive first of all as you know so we have to give them that extra protection and care so all these instruments that i said you know big hospitals may be aware but small nursing homes is always a challenge so i would request everyone if you have a morbidly obese pregnant woman should always be in a institutional delivery not in nursing homes no, i completely Very agree yeah. because this is a this is a major issue happening right because a lot of them are in different cities where there you don't have the the kind of a uh you know tertiary care centers and uh, as we see that there are women who are coming for gallbladder surgeries who are 110 kg 120 kg right and when they obviously when they are going for pregnancy and delivery uh, it will be a challenge for the hospitals okay Absolutely. thank you so much the second question is about the thromboprophylaxis uh, you have been very elaborate on this i just wanted to know so are you are you not concerned about when you give these low molecular weight heparin are you concerned about the bleeding postpartum hemorrhage in these patients not with low molecular weight heparin in fact many of my patients uh, who have got um, like uh, during pregnancy many of the women who uh, have uh, Uh, phospho anti phospholipid syndrome etc and many ivf i do a lot of, uh, of uh, patients who deliver after ivf they on lmwh throughout their pregnancy then we stop it just before prior to say at uh, i would say 37 weeks we stop but we can start immediately postpartum because it's it's uh, it's not pure heparin that we give lmwh does not increase uh, the the risk so, so i in fact it agree is, Yeah, 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 it doesn't yeah. increase the risk, and if you have a post uh, partum, if you have a post partum pulmonary embolism, it is fatal for the woman. I think you know, uh, uh, everyone knows about this Pandus uh, Panduskas case in uh, a case where a doctor couple. Paluskar or something. I think it is in a in a district in Maharashtra where both her, where they delivered a ba- patient. She was an obese woman, and they went for a conference. And in their absence, I don't think the locum was there. And the patient came back with breathlessness. And on the phone, they prescribed something, and the patient died of pulmonary embolism. And now they uh, the they are in court. They are in jail. Actually, they were jailed. They're out on bail only because there was negligence in the fact that. telephonic advice was given and no doctor had seen so we, it is a warning to everybody that if we are not there we keep a locum yeah. and we should be prepared that within 48 hours if a patient comes with breathlessness think thromboembolism yeah i completely agree i raised this point just to uh, you know highlight it because in bariatric patients we routinely give them uh, low molecular weight heparin and the uh, pumps and the stocking and everything and in and a large number of patients we continue it for a week after discharge and in some patients who are high risk we even continue it for a month so uh, the idea is to somehow ensure that there are no deaths and no no major complications so i completely agree with the, your statement thank you so much dr unnati do you have any questions for ma'am i do from have questions from the audience okay in fact before the session started only the questions kept coming okay so i have my first question is uh, doctor is there a bmi chart to follow uh, an optimal gestational weight gain or how should one monitor her weight during pregnancy no i gave you a chart there is a very nice uh, chart that we have that if you are under undernourished how much weight you should uh, gain if you are within which uh, um, that uh, bmi uh, type 1 2 and 3 how much should be the weight gain 
So that is that weight gain is definitely less than norm, what one would normally put on. Because usually in the first trimester, there is weight loss. Then in the second trimester, up to 20 weeks, there is weight is static. Then after 20 weeks, half kilo per week up to the 37th week. So that will be 7 to 11 kilos. That is a normal uh, pregnancy. But during in, if the patient is obese, then the weight gain should be less. And that that is why every morbidly obese pregnant woman has to be referred to a dietitian. We, it, it should be the dietitian and the nutrition expert plus um, um, lifestyle coach. In the sense, uh, you know, we have these Lamas classes. We have prenatal exercises. So these two go hand in hand. So that, uh, the, the, so we have to monitor that they don't put on too much of weight. And there are Thank you for that available. answer. And there are charts available. Yeah. Of course. You did show that in your presentation. So thank you. Yeah. I have a question which I know you have answered, but just to reiterate it for the audience. What are the life-threatening complications associated with pregnancy in obese mothers? This is a question by Dr. Yogesh Yadav. Yes. yes, of course. Life-threatening is, of course, greater increase of pregnancy-induced hypertension, which will become so severe that they, even with treatment, you might have to terminate the pregnancy pregnancy early, you might have, uh, and they are more prone to get full-blown eclampsia, fulminating preeclampsia, eclampsia, and deaths. So that is one. The second, of course, is deep pain thrombosis, which is really the most life-threatening one. And then third is if the patient has to have a cesarean section, and the, if she has had to, if they can, if this uh, anesthetist can't get the spinal or epidural, which they very often can't, and they give a general anesthesia, then sudden death because of pulmonary hyper, um, uh, uh, pulmonary embolism also, but also pulmonary edema is very common. So these are really life threatening. That's all from the audience. I would again like to express my sincere gratitude to you from all our viewers and from the entire Doc Lexus team. I know we all know how busy your routine is and that the kind of you know patients you have every day. Thank you for still taking out the time and doing this, Dr. Kiran. We look forward to hear from you again. My pleasure, Unati. Thank you. Over to you, Dr. Raman. Would you like to start your session now? Yep. So, first of all, let me thank Dr. Coelho once again for uh, joining here and uh, giving her inputs about obesity and uh, pregnancy. And uh, I'll be talking today on how the bariatric surgery affects pregnancy. Some of the is uh, issues have already been discussed, but it's a very important concern. You know, every, every woman in the reproductive age group who comes to us for a for a bariatric surgery, she and her family are always asking this question routinely that what about the impact on her possibility of conceiving, what will happen during pregnancy, whether fetus will get enough nutrition, uh, uh, what will happen to the child thereafter. So I think this is one of the most important questions that we, have, we are asked to answer. And uh, it's so important that we work together with the uh, obstetricians like Dr. Coelho and other senior people to understand how, how obesity and how weight loss after bariatric surgery impacts pregnancy and delivery. So I'll briefly share uh, my presentation and uh, then I'll be, we'll be happy to answer a few questions together. <laughs> So greetings from our Center for Metabolic Surgery. Uh, I operate at Vokard Hospital and uh, uh, PD Hinduja Hospital at Khar and Zen in Chembur. And today I'm going to talk about uh, bariatric surgery and pregnancy. Now, uh, we all know that uh, obesity affects uh, a person in various ways. There are over 200 comorbidities which are now recognized uh, to be to be promoted by obesity and they they are they are the main reason why obesity is now considered a mother of most of the diseases uh, uh, just one or two slides on how obesity affects ivf she has already spoken about it but there are many studies which shows that in ivf patients who are going for ivf 
in women with obesity there are decreased chances of pregnancy and live birth so the outcomes of ivf are also determined by the the bmi of the woman and it's very important to realize it at an early stage if ivf is not successful just to show you this lady who was 39 year old when she came was referred to us by a by an ivf center from delhi where she has undergone six or seven attempts uh, and she could not conceive and we were also very skeptical to op do offer a bariatric surgery because she was very emotional and wanted uh, a, a pregnancy uh, desperately and we did a bariatric surgery and in about one years time after bariatric surgery in her first attempt of ivf she conceived and delivered uh, a healthy baby through cesarean and i remember her because she called me from the operating room she said i have made first call to my husband and the uh, second call is to you because of the bariatric surgery i have been able to have a child which was a dream so uh, it was around when she was about 42 year old and she delivered a baby now how does bariatric surgery and or uh, uh, has a uh, what role it plays in terms of metabolic syndrome we know that metabolic syndrome uh, Uh, it makes the pregnancy a high risk pregnancy because of various reasons and dr coelho has very nicely explained all that increasing blood pressure eclampsia diabetes growth disorders higher rates of cesarean higher mater maternal mortality and uh, we know that the mother's health determine the child's health in future not only as a child even as an adult so there is a increased risk of metabolic disease in the in the child if mother is a uh, is obese or a severely obese now there is a study which has been done in women who have delivered before bariatric surgery and who have also delivered after bariatric surgery and they have analyzed the the pregnancies of these 288 women so there were let's say about 140 women who had pregnancy before such bariatric surgery and after bariatric surgery and they have shown that there is a significant improvement in hypertension and diabetes uh, there is a decreased cesarean rate more women could deliver normally after a bariatric surgery there was decreased length of labor and was decreased neonatal birth weight because in uh, morbidly obese women uh, the 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 fetal uh, weight is high and that becomes much healthier after bariatric surgery now a major question remains because many women like this lady who whom i shown uh they come late to us when they are more than 35 year old and they they want to have a quick uh, pregnancy after weight loss and so uh, we always encourage them to wait for at least one year so that they should not get pregnant during the period of rapid weight loss and metabolic changes which are happening uh, after bariatric surgery and this study shows that there were 104 pregnancies uh, in less than one year so if you see the mean was about 7 months of bariatric surgery compared to another 385 pregnancies uh, which happened after one year of surgery bariatric surgery they found there was no difference in maternal complications fetal outcomes or delivery complications this is our experience also but this is not to not to justify early pregnancies so what happens is that there are many women who are who are sort of uh, not having periods for for few months or years before they get a bariatric surgery done and after bariatric surgery due to rapid weight loss their fertility improves and if they are not following a contraceptive measures uh, they are likely to get pregnant on second third or fourth month or even you know and then it becomes extremely difficult because it's a precious pregnancy maybe after 15 years of marriage to tell the woman to abort so some of them they 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 hide the pregnancy from the bariatric surgeon and they they continue with the pregnancy and then we find that this kind of outcomes are there but universally it is advisable that women should wait for about 8 months to 1 year after a bariatric surgery a word of caution which was already said by dr coelho is that we must uh, so if a woman is planning a pregnancy after bariatric surgery we must do a complete uh, a nutritional assessment in terms of vitamins minerals and other nutritional areas especially folic acid levels and folic acid is not only for neural defect 
but also folic acid is an indicator of whether the patient has adequate is adequately taking vitamins and minerals so uh, this should be always be done uh, so if a woman comes back to us after bariatric surgery after one year and says i'm i want to plan a pregnancy we always get this done to make sure that the pregnancy and the baby is healthy and this i have already said there are unexpected spontaneous pregnancies immediately after surgery and uh, and uh, uh, it's important that contraception should be discussed with them many of them laugh laugh at us that we are not able to conceive and you are telling us to use contraceptive but i think it's very important that we talk seriously about this and emphasize that uh, terminating a precious pregnancy will be more painful than avoiding it for 8 to 9 months now as far as delivery is concerned i think she has discussed in detail but uh, uh, deliveries the, the incidence of diabetes and uh, cesarean deliveries were drastically decreased after bariatric surgery this is, these are the, the studies which have shown and bariatric surgery did not increase rates of postpartum hemorrhage infection or fetal demise so uh, bariatric surgery does not cause the kind of complication that people discuss but it definitely uh, improves the possibility of a normal delivery now as far as impact on child's health is concerned uh, the it has been seen that uh, as i mentioned it's not about the child's health that adult obesity was approximately less 50% less if the woman has already lost weight before her pregnancy so uh, those who uh, delivered after they have lost weight uh, they are less likely to have a uh, have a person uh, as a child who will be obese so to conclude this is the position statement by of american society of bariatric surgery endorsed by american college of obstetric and gynecology which says that uh, obesity associated with delay in conception even in uh, it also leads to the male infertility in terms of reduced sperm counts and motility and weight loss can improve pcos and insulin resistant related infertility there is lower probability of live birth and after ivf in obese and bariatric surgery is effective in achieving significant and sustained weight loss and thus to improve fertility pregnancy is not recommended during the rapid weight loss phase after bariatric surgery that is the first year and counseling and follow up regarding contraception during this period is important so so what is practiced is uh, or what is uh, recommended is what should be practiced and that helps in having a safe pregnancy and delivery friends it's important to realize bariatric surgery is the only accepted treatment of obesity which is taken care by the insurance now right from 2013 central government pays for all the bariatric surgeries across the country uh, for the their employees and their dependent most of the large corporates had been paying for bariatric surgery for last few years and now from october 2020 all insurance companies are paying for bariatric surgery on a cashless basis so now in the after covid second wave almost 80% of our patients are being operated on a cashless basis and they they get the surgery done and then obviously for those who can't afford and have no insurance then there are financing options just to show you uh, bariatric surgery requires a very good quality operating room facility uh, we have the same kind of facility this is vocard hospital operation theater we have equally well equipped operating room at hindu jakhar as well and this is the place where you can reach out to us and we'll be very happy to share any uh, to answer any of your questions so uh thank you so much for your patient listening uh dr anati i'll be very happy to answer any questions from you or dr koilo uh, if you want to, to go ahead and yeah thank you so much yeah a lovely talk uh, as always dr raman i had one question do you uh, uh, send them to a gynecologist for contraception Uh, your patients yeah so generally uh, what happens is we tell them to meet their uh, their own gynecologist right these uh, these patients have been with their gynecologist for 
decades, let's say, yeah. because they, they've been trying to... No, no, I didn't, I didn't mean that way. Yes, they have to go to their uh -huh. gynecologist, but uh, in these patients, you know, contraception is also uh, um, a problem because you can't give them oral contraceptive uh, drugs because they are already obese and that will increase and they already have a metabolic syndrome, uh, syndrome so again that will increase then uh, you put in a copper tea or a copper majilo that for a, a young girl you can't do that and uh, barrier con contraception is the only uh, uh, method and that is not very well liked by the couple so that's why many of the patients you know they conceive immediately <laughs> I think that that's uh, that's very good because we never thought it this way. Yeah. We always tell them that you know where every woman and the husband knows about contraception, but I think this puts everything in perspective. Yeah, contraception very difficult in these patients. Absolutely. The husband should agree to use a condom. Otherwise, and you know, unfortunately, in our country, we don't have the diaphragm. Others, diaphragm was very good. Then, then the control is with the woman. So then it becomes very difficult for them. So contraception is a big issue. <laughs> Excellent. I mean, I, I learned something very important today. And I'll rather be talking to the gynecologist uh, when we refer patients that these are right. the, these are your observations. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you. Dr. Excellent Anna. talk, Dr. Raman. Appreciate all your time and efforts that you put in this program. So uh, would you want to take up a question now? Sure. Let's do it. So uh, the question is that there are several case reports of unexpected vitamin deficiency, especially vitamin B B12, after a bariatric surgery. And we know that that vitamin is very important for a pregnant woman. So wow, how should one tackle that problem, especially if the woman is breastfeeding the infant? So, uh, Dr. Unnati, this is not a unexpected uh, problem. Uh, a very large percentage of population, even without bariatric surgery in India, has vitamin B12 deficiency. Most of us will have, you know. And uh, especially people who live in a healthy environment, sanitized environment, the vitamin B B12 deficiency is very common. So after bariatric surgery, all the patients are advised to uh, receive B12 supplement on a regular basis. Now, only patients who are not complying with the requirement, B12 deficiencies are seen. Uh, we have, and in India, we have excellent sub, uh, sublingual uh, vitamin B12 tablets, and we give them maybe once a week or twice a week, and that is enough. We don't have to give injectable vitamin B12 in India. This is more of a issue in uh, Western countries where they have to give. And so I think this is a responsibility of the bariatric program and also the obstetrician that uh, during pregnancy, we ensure that they, they remain healthy and uh, a minimum amount. So now when we are giving a supplement, we are giving supplement of what is regularly required. Not We are not overdosing them. So I believe, and obviously Dr. Coelho can explain that better, that even during lactation, uh, what are, whatever is the RDA, that much B12, the woman can be supplemented. And we are not obviously not overdosing, so I don't foresee. And B12 doesn't have a toxic dose. You know, B12 toxic dose is very high. So even if somebody is a little bit overdosed, it doesn't really matter. Dr. Coelho, do you want to add on to the uh, lactating woman here? I think you are muted. Yeah, Dr. Goyal, no, it is very important. And there are sub, as you said, the sublingual uh, B, B complex vitamins are very, very valuable to these patients because, as it is, they don't like to take so many medicines. Absorption is poor. So, this is very good. And um, their diet also is not, uh, they have to be very careful, have frequent small meals, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, that I think we inform all the patients. But sublingual uh, vitamins are very good. Thank you. I think both of you answered that question beautifully and then rest of the queries I think were answered in the presentation. So Dr. Kiran, Dr. Raman, we have uh, one of Dr. Raman's patients with us, Ms. Megha. Uh, Ms. Megha, could you please turn your video camera on? So Dr. Kiran, we invite uh, these post-pediatric surgery patients every week that they can share their experience live with the STPs and with the audience so that, you know, the doctors also get to know that how a person is doing post-pediatric surgery. Yeah. Ms. Megha, are you there with us? Can you hear us? 
I think she's muted. Yeah, she's there. Hi, Miss Mega. Hello. Yeah, I'm so sorry. Yeah. No, no, that's okay. We can hear you, see you clearly. Can you see us? Can you hear us? Yes, 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 I can. Okay. Hi, Miss Mega. It's a pleasure to have you here. And it takes a lot of guts to come and talk about your story, especially when it comes to health. So we have Dr. Kiran, who's a very famous obstetrician and gynecologist herself. And you know Dr. Raman, of course, he was your doctor. So I just have a couple of questions for you, if you're okay with it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So would you like to tell us what health issues were you facing pre-bariatric surgery? What were the challenges that you had? Uh, Pre-bariatric surgery, I basically got myself operated when I was 21. So back then, I did not have any issues at all, but I rather got into the surgery as a, a preventative measure so that I don't get those complications at all to begin with. So I got operated in 2010, around uh, 11, 12 years ago now. So yeah, and I haven't had any complications uh, regarding obesity as such because I have managed to maintain myself pretty well so far. Good to know. I think that's a very bold step knowing that that you do not have a complication and you still uh, took the decision of bariatric surgery. So what motivated you to go ahead and take uh, do the bariatric surgery? Uh, the thing was that uh, I had to go for uh, bariatric surgery because my weight issues uh, stemmed from the fact that I was given recovery steroids before I was one year old. Uh, to save my life, a long story, I won't get into that. So because of that, I uh, used to have a lot of water retention. So the thing was, no matter how much I tried, right from my seventh standard, I remember going to gym, trying different diets and whatnot, uh, nothing uh, medicinal or medical, but uh, whatever I could to bring my weight to a certain level, but nothing seemed to work. And no, even it wasn't even a scene where my weight was chalo, 80 kilos and it stayed that way. It wasn't like that. It always kept increasing and increasing and increasing. There was no limit to where my weight was going. So finally, when I was 121 kilos, when I was just 21 years old, we thought we should take a decision uh, before it goes, you know, extremely morbidly obese or something like that. Wonderful. I think you have answered that wonderfully. So I'm, I'm. So it was 11 years before you got the surgery. So yeah. are you married now? Do you have a family? Uh, I am uh, separated now, actually. I have a four-year-old daughter. Wow. But, uh, I, she is the healthiest child I've ever seen. <laughs> So I think since our topic today was regarding obesity and pregnancy, so would you like to share your journey that post-obesity surgery, did you have any complications during your pregnancy? How was it? How did the entire experience go? Definitely. So uh, right when I got my surgery done, I was 21. So I had asked, as Dr. Goel said, patients come in with a lot of questions. I had even gone one step further to ask, will the staples in the surgery hurt my child? Will they poke my child like such? So I had gone into it, you know, uh, with all my eyes open, you can say. And then when, uh, during the pregnancy, first of all, there was no issue with conception whatsoever. And I had the most uncomplicated pregnancy that I've seen. I had nothing, as in I was living a very regular life. I had no cravings. I had no pains. I had no, uh, I don't know what that thing is called. We have uh, issues with the nerves in the legs. I forgot. Scolius, I don't know what the name was, but none of that, nothing, no backache, no, and uh, my height is approximately six feet, so my stomach did not show till I was in my eighth month. I didn't even look pregnant. I used to take lectures. I am a lecturer, so I used to take lectures on my feet for eight hours a day till approximately two weeks before I delivered. And I asked the doctor whether this lifestyle is healthy for the child because I had not gained weight at all. Uh, I was around 70, 72 kilos and I had hardly gained 5 kilos throughout the pregnancy. So I was a little worried. Is the child not growing well? Is it uh, malnutrition? Is it whatever? Because uh, having gone through health issues or, you know, having seen that maybe I might have it, I was very uh, nervous, you can say. but. Touch wood, uh, even during the day the child was born, uh, actually what happened was I 
delivered her two weeks before my due date. Three weeks before my due date, I got a viral fever and I was in saline for a week. But till that day, the doctor had said that I was all set for a natural delivery. But because of the saline, the water in my stomach had reduced and it was causing pressure to the child. And I had to go through a cesarean. The child was 2.4 kilos and two weeks uh, premature. But she was not declared as a premature child because she was extremely healthy, touch wood. Extremely healthy. She cried on time and all her statistics were normal. So even though she was... Uh, something 200, 300 grams overweight according to their standards and two weeks uh, before time, she was still declared as a naturally delivered child and uh, she wasn't premature. <laughs> so it was a very beautiful pregnancy with multiple Beautiful story and I hope your child always remains healthy. You always remain healthy. Thank so you. I hope you are, are you uh, following your post bariatric surgery protocol till date? Uh, honestly speaking, for a couple of years in the middle, I had let it go. I had not uh, exercised. I uh, had not uh, paid much attention to my diet. But honestly speaking, even when I did not pay attention, I still managed to maintain like a regular person. But, you know, when you have uh, had like four or five parties in a month, you gain two, three kilos. And then when you're eating regular gharelu uh, khana, then you come back to what you were. So I'm leaving, living a very normal life. Uh, where I don't have to worry too much, oh my God, if I eat this, how much will I gain? If I don't, what will happen? And that it's pretty relaxed. Great to know that. Appreciate all your efforts. Congratulations for you that you completed mm -hmm. your surgery successfully and you had a healthy pregnancy. And appreciate all your efforts of coming out here. I'm sure your story is going to inspire a lot of people here. So Dr. Kiran, Dr. Raman, anything for Miss Megha? Dr. Koilo? Yeah, Megha, wonderful story. And I think, you, you know, you've managed to keep that weight off. You've had a beautiful pregnancy, a lovely, this thing. So absolute success story of bari bariatric surgery. So important. Okay. I'm so happy. <laughs> thank you so much, ma'am. Well, thank you. I did to come and speak today. I was so happy. <laughs> I know. And a lot of thanks to Dr. Raman. <laughs> <laughs> definitely, definitely. Because yeah. I mean, the whole time, you know, when people after a successful uh, delivery, they thank God, oh my God, it went well. I like, thank Dr. Goel, it went well. God was yeah, not yeah. the first person on my mind. <laughs> so, you know, Mega has a, you know, it, she has maintained weight and she has delivered a beautiful baby. Uh, but, you know, people don't realize one statement from her today maybe giving hope to so many women across the country because this program is watched by family physicians and uh, once this hear a, a story from a mother's uh, directly from her they will be able to convince their their patients anywhere you know they can get a surgery done in delhi or calcutta that is not the issue the issue is at the end of the day those women who are who are not getting the benefit of bariatric surgery in time or uh, they were scared because they thought that pregnancy might affect pregnancy. So she is like a role model for so many of uh, the future women that even we will never know. But uh, but it's just so important. So thank you so much for joining in today. And thank you so much for inviting me. <laughs> and uh, congratulations, Dr. Raman. Good, great work, Dr. Raman. And congratulations to Mira. Ultimately, bariatric surgery is as successful as the patient makes it successful. So thank you so much. And thanks, Dr. Thanks, Dr. Coilo, for uh, being here on the program today. And, uh, you know. Thank you for inviting me. I enjoyed the program. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much again, Dr. Kiran, Dr. Raman. This, Dr. Raman, I keep telling you, this is a great initiative. And this is currently one of my favorite academic programs. So I'm I'm sure our viewers here are taking away a lot of insights. Miss Megha, your face, your radiance tells everything that how things have been for you. I uh, would like to tell you all the best for your future journey. And to all our viewers out there, I hope you're gaining some valuable insights from this. And please stay tuned with us next Thursday. We will be back where we will discuss the next series, next program of obesity management. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.